Professor Tantzi also acts regularly as counsel, advocate, and arbitrator in interstate and investor state disputes, currently a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and a conciliator at the OSCE, which stands for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Court of Conciliation and Arbitration. He's also chairman of the Implementation Committee of the United Nations Economic Commission of Europe, UNESE 1992 Convention on Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses and International Lakes. He has been chairman of the legal board of the same convention between 2004 and 2012, chairman of the Compliance Committee of the 1999 UNESCO Protocol on Water and Health. And in the summer of 2021, he also gave special course on international arbitration at the Hague Academy of International Law, extensive list of publications in English, French, Italian, and Spanish in various areas of international law, with special regard to dispute settlement, the law of state responsibility, jurisdictional immunities, international investment law, international environmental law, and the law of international water courses. His publication also includes a concise introduction to international law published by 11 in 2019. Oh, lo long and very, very successful uh, academic and professional legal career. Attila, it's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, we want you to come to India and meet us in person as soon as the travel resumes, but uh, for the moment, we still operate in online mode. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, welcome to our student. Uh, and uh, they are very eager to hear from your experience and your uh, thoughts about international arbitration and about uh, everything you want to tell these uh, bright students will be most welcome. Well, the format is you speak first and then we take questions. I'm Ankit will moderate the question and answer session. Okay, thank you very, very much, Professor Poposki. Dear Vesseling, well, your invitation looks like an, an extremely attractive perspective, uh, one which uh, I will count on, uh, and I can't wait uh, for uh, the circumstances to allow me to to join you in India and I wish to thank also Ankit uh, for moderating and the rest of your team and Jindal uh, Society. Uh, well in fact my my chat is is going to be rather rather general today. Uh, um, I know of your personal interest in United Nations affairs, so I directed my my thoughts on the role of the United Nations um, in the codification and progressive development of international law and more, more widely on the United Nations role in the international law process. Now, Based on more than 75 years of practice, international practice, it is unanimously by now considered as a matter of course that the United Nations are and have been all along the leading agent for the codification and development of international law, whether we call it progressive or, or not. But this does not exclude that it would be appropriate for us to to look into the forms and shapes that such a role has taken over the years. And I suppose that giving due consideration to it may prove, looking back, may prove useful to better appreciate where we stand and where we, we are going forward. Um, in the Uncharted, we find at least two references which provide the legal basis uh, for the organization to engage in, in these endeavors. Article 31, paragraph 1 states that the General Assembly shall initiate studies and make recommendations 
for the purposes of a promoting international cooperation in the political field and encouraging the progressive development of international law and its codification now international law scholars tend to curtail their attention to this provision which is paragraph one small letter a of article 13 of the charter and then they would directly focus on the ilc international law commission and the outcome of its workings. But I believe it would be wrong to assume that the International Law Commission related work exhausts the role of the United Nations in promoting the development of international law in the whole spectrum of fields which are referred to under the next uh, small letter B. And uh, Article 13, paragraph B, adds that, and I quote, the further responsibilities, functions and powers of the General Assembly with respect to matters mentioned in paragraph 1B of Article 13 are set forth in chapters 9 and 10 of the Charter. And the matters mentioned in this paragraph 1B are economic, social, cultural health and human rights matters. They then therefore cover quite a significant slice of the subject matters which are governed by international law. Indeed, since we just read about reference to art, uh, chapter 9 of the Charter, Article 55, which is in Chapter 9 of the Charter, must date the United Nations as a whole to take care of, so to say, promotion of standards in these matters that I've just mentioned. So the main takeaway from this provision is that next to the General Assembly, all the other organs of the United Nations are responsible for the consolidation and development of international law. By way of anticipation, I may recall the Secretary General and the Secretariat with its authoritative reports in the widest spectrum of areas from the maintenance of international peace and security to sustainable development. The ECOSOC, especially in the field of human rights and the environmental protection, but the Security Council, for example, in the development of international criminal law. Um, to mention a few examples, um, the International Court of Justice, especially but not exclusively through its obiter dicta in contentious cases, as well as through advisory opinions. Now, further to these preliminary remarks, my lecture will come in four parts. First, I will provide a bird's eye view on the contribution of the United Nations principal organs to the codification and development of international law. This part will be divided in two legs. In the first one, I will dwell upon the contribution of the General Assembly. In the second one, I will, I will briefly address the contribution of uh, the Security Council. Secondly, I will focus on the ILC and its forms of codification. I will here argue that the distinction between codification and progressive development as enshrined in the ILC statute and in Article 13, is a blurred one, possibly an unnecessary one, certainly one which has been disproven by practice. I will here also provide a quick appraisal of the views recently expressed in the legal literature on the role of the ILC in today's international legal system. Thirdly, I'll make a quick reference to the role of the ICJ and other United Nations related adjudicative bodies in the elucidation and development of international law. I'll finally wind up with few concluding remarks. Well, now, let me address the role of the General Assembly. The UN General Assembly usually draws the jurisprudential and scholarly attention in relation to the impact of international organizations' resolutions on the development of international law. This is no accident given the near universal governmental participation in the 
General Assembly of the United Nations and given its general competence under the Charter. From a cumulative perspective, General Assembly resolutions unquestionably partake in the creative developing process of international law, and they do so together with the consolidation role, they do so at one at the same time as authoritative pieces of multilateral diplomatic practice and as expressions of opinion juries by those states that have positively taken part in their adoption. As the late Judge James Crawford put it, and I quote, when General Assembly resolutions are concerned with general norms of international law, acceptance by all or most members constitutes evidence of the opinions of governments in what is the widest forum for the expression of such opinions." Unquote. The International Court of Justice has consistently confirmed this view. For instance, in the Nicaragua versus United States case, the court in addressing the customary nature of the prohibition of the use of force, observed that, and I quote, opinion juries may, though with due caution, be deduced from inter alia, the attitude of the parties and the attitude of states towards certain General Assembly resolutions, end of quotation. The state's attitude vis-a-vis -a, -vis a General Assembly resolution may be instrumental in generating a new piece of custom if in the long term the General Assembly resolution in question cajoles widespread state practice in conformity with its contents. This amounts to say that the well-known threefold possibility of coincidence between a codification convention and customary international law famously spelled out by the ICJ in the 1969 North Sea Continental Shelf case, applies just as well in the relationship between customary law and General Assembly resolutions. I am referring to the custom evidentiary, crystallizing and generating functions. This approach reminds us of the apparent limitation of General Assembly resolutions in this matter. Namely, as put it in the ILC draft conclusions on identification of custom international law, I quote, a resolution adopted by an international organization cannot by itself create custom international law, end of quotation. Another truism, which nonetheless seems often overlooked, is that United Nations resolutions, in addition to indicating states' opinion juries on the existence of a certain custom, are taken into account as terms of reference for ascertaining the specific contents of that custom. Again, a most, most authoritative example of this was given by the ICJ in the Nicaragua versus United States case. Here I would like to single out how the court referred to the Friendly Relations Declaration annexed to Resolution 2625 of 1970 in order to assess the scope of the customary ban on the use of force as encompassing the organization, training, funding and arming of irregular forces with a view to carrying out acts fueling civil war or terrorism in a foreign country. The ICJ ruling of 1997 in the Gabchikov Najimaros case seems to go very much in the same direction. Here, the court invited the parties to jointly reinterpret the 1977 bilateral treaty on the realization of a joint project on the Danube based on the fact that, and I quote, new norms and standards have been developed, set forth in a great number of instruments over the last two decades. 
Such norms have to be taken into consideration and such new standards given proper weight, not only when states contemplate new activities, but also when continuing with activities begun in the past. This need to reconcile economic development with protection of the environment is aptly expressed in the concept of sustainable development." End of quotation. This passage is significant for our purposes insofar as it clearly refers also to legally non-binding instruments in the field of international environmental law, which were produced under the aegis of the United Nations. Complemented by other elements of international practice, including articulated conventional practice, such instruments gave rise and substantiated new norms under the view of the court, which constitute the building block of international environmental law, which expressed and gave effect to the then newly emerged principle of sustainable development. While I have in mind the final declarations of the United Nations Conference uh, of 1972 held in Stockholm and the Rio Declaration at, adopted at the end of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 1992. Equally, these kinds of uh, non-legally binding instruments just like General Assembly resolutions, um, have formidably contributed to the codification and progressive development of human rights law. Going back to General Assembly resolutions, one needs just to recall the Universal Declaration of, on Human Rights of 1948, which served as the drafting basis for the two 1966 United Nations Covenants. Another interesting example pertains to the way in which the body of international law on the treatment of aliens has been gradually reshaped by the process of adoption of a series of ECOSOC and General Assembly resolutions throughout the 1960s and 1970s. The gradual process of adoption of such resolutions increasingly upheld the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources in a way which undermined or derogated from certain customary tenets at the time on the treatment of aliens, one such tenet being a priori wrongfulness of expropriation. The so-called New International Economic Order, the NIEO framework produced by the cumulative effect of a series of United Nations resolutions led to the conditional lawfulness of expropriation, subject to the avoidance of discrimination and arbitrariness and the payment of some kind of appropriate compensation, possibly falling short of the full value of the expropriated assets. Here, the countervailing principle increasingly upheld by the large majority of the plenary United Nations organ was that of the permanent sovereignty of natural resources and of the right for states to autonomously regulate economic activities on their territory without exception for those activities which were carried out by foreign companies. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the disruption of the former Soviet Union, and the new attitude of a large number of developing countries back in the 1990s, geared towards attracting foreign investments, curbed or even neutralized the impact of the new international economic order resolutions on the international customary law process on the treatment of foreign direct investment. Over the last two decades, an increasing number of study reports by special representatives of the Secretary General in different areas, from economic law to human rights, and debates and negotiations in United Nations subsidiary organs, um, in, or independent ones, including ancestral working groups, seem now to reflect a new change of the attitude of states in the matter, which is formidably 
reminiscent of the new international economic order debate and possibly of its impact on the customary discourse on the topic. I make these brief considerations to show how the drafting and adoption of General Assembly resolutions on, or even just officially recorded debates within the context of the plenary United Nations organs may reflect or even, or even give in portion to the swinging pendulum of the dynamics which determine international lawmaking progress. If only eliciting the state's opinion juries, including opinion necessitatis. Let me now turn to uh, shortly to the Security Council. Despite its limited membership and its specific competence in the field of international peace and security, its contribution to the development of international law or even its consolidation should not be underestimated. I may recall that in Tadic, the appeals chamber of the ICTY International um, Tribunal for the, form, for the Crimes Committed in the Former Yugoslavia observed that, and I quote, of great relevance to the formation of opinion juries to the effect that violations of general international humanitarian law governing internal armed conflicts entail the criminal responsibility of those committing or ordering those violations are certain resolutions unanimously adopted by the Security Council, end of quotation. Similarly, in its 2008 advisory opinion on the unilateral declaration of independence in respect of Kosovo, the International Court of Justice referred to the Security Council practice to corroborate the non-existence under customer international law of a general prohibition against unilateral declaration of independence. Other important lawmaking contributions emerging from the Security Council practice relate to human rights obligations of non-state actors, the stages of peace agreements ending non-international armed conflicts, and possibly issues regarding post-conflict reconstruction, especially with respect to democratic transitions. The Security Council has unquestionably contributed to the progressive development and consolidation of criminal and international law. Not only was the actual establishment of the CTY and the ICTR for Rwanda through Chapter 7 legally binding resolution so very remarkable, most importantly, one is to note the key contribution to the codification of international criminal law directly deriving from the adoption of the statutes of those tribunals attached to the resolutions in point. Such statutes included rules which at the time pertained to the progressive development of the law with special regard to certain crimes against humanity. This achievement was all the more remarkable when one considers that back then a first codification project of international crimes had been stuck for decades between the International Law Commission and the General Assembly. Further to such direct contribution, one is to consider two indirect forms of contribution to the consolidation and development of international criminal law, stemming from Security Council resolutions. The first one flows from the case law which the tribunals in question have developed over the years, especially in the development and finessing of international criminal procedural law, based on the legal authority deriving from Chapter 7 based resolutions. The indirect contribution can be said Another indirect contribution can be said to have operated by contrast, namely in the sense that this piecemeal approach to international criminal justice prompted by contrast the need for a permanent and treaty-based international criminal court, one which was actually established 
under the aegis of the United Nations and one whose statute largely benefited from the lessons learned from the operation of both ICTY and ICTR, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. I, I will shortly revert, revert this in due course. I will now address the importance of the contribution of the International Law Commission to the codification and development of customer international law. Now, at, at, at the beginning of my chat, I, I anticipated reference to Article 13.1a of the Charter, which mandates the General Assembly to initiate, and I quote, initiate studies and make recommendations for the purpose of encouraging the progressive development of international law and its codification. Now, in order to follow up on this provision, the General Assembly established the International Law Commission in 1947. The statute of the International Law Commission contains a mandate which bestows particular value to its work when it comes to affirming the existence and content of customer international law. Accordingly, the International Court of Justice in many um, decisions, Nicaragua versus the United States, Capchico, which I've already mentioned, the application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the Jurisdictional Immunities case. Then the Idlers in its advisory opinion on activities in the area, the European Court of Human Rights, amongst others in Barami and Saramati versus France, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Gutierrez and Family versus Argentina, amongst others, and plenty of exit arbitration tribunals in Conoco Phillips versus Venezuela, amongst others, they have all relied on the ILC work on various topics for the purposes of identifying and corroborating pieces of international customary law. Interestingly, reference to the ILC work was made without the format, without reference to the format of codification affecting the level of authority so accorded by international adjudicators. The reverse effect also applies, namely references to the work of the International Law Commission naturally strengthen its authority, although some states have raised concerns about it when consent is lacking by states. It has occurred that judicial reference to ongoing ILC codification work would compromise or inhibit subsequent amendments to its work. This is what happened when in the Gabchikova Najimaru's judgment, the ILC referred to draft to then draft Article 33 on, of the Law of State Responsibility Draft Articles, which regarded a state of necessity as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness, which, which the court found to be evidentiary of the state of international customary law at the time. That court assessment froze that very restrictive language of draft article 33 in a way which prevented the commission from amending it in more flexible terms as it was minded to do prior to the handing down of the court's decision. I will now share with you a few additional considerations on the forms of codification of the ILC work. The choice of the form of codification used to, used to be considered to depend on the status of custom international law <coughs> at the time of the working of the International Law Commission, namely conventional format that is a codification organized by way of draft articles suitable for serving as the negotiating basis for a future convention. This would be generally considered to be better suited to 
bodies of customary law which already existed. So instruments recognizing, evidencing existing customer international law. Commercially, the soft law format that is a codification organized by means of different and more flexible approaches, such as model rules, studies, guidelines, would be generally considered to be instrumental to the progressive development of customer international law. This distinction actually stems from Article 15 of the Commission statute. However, as it has been emphasized by the very Commission, the distinction between codification and progressive development has, and I quote, proved unworkable and could be eliminated in any review of the statute, unquote. This is because, as Sir Robert Jennings once observed, I quote, codification properly conceived is itself a method for the progressive development of the law, unquote. Indeed, whenever customer international law is transcribed and codified, it is inevitably interpreted and specified, and such interpretation and specification inevitably affects its contents. This ties in with the considerations made a moment, a moment ago on the different relationships between customer international law and United Nations instruments, namely of recognition, crystallization or generation of customer international law. Now the dilemma arises as to which format, whether conventional or soft, would be best for the LC and products. Two basic methodological considerations should drive the choice, as I see it at least. The first consideration refers to the inadequacy of any a priori choice between the two options. This translates, as I will try to illustrate in a moment, into a rejection of any a priori natural law or legal positivist approach to codification. The second methodological consideration, which flows from the first one, points at the need to take into account all the relevant circumstances pertaining to the ILC work on any given topic at any given point in time. One such circumstance may depend on whether the Commission is pursuing a codification exercise or is aiming at facilitating the interpretation and application of previously codified rules. Another circumstance may pertain to the subject matter being dealt with, the degree of development and consolidation of the custom international law in this area. Most importantly, reference should be had to the historical political context existing at the time the process of codification is being carried out. A natural law approach to the sources of law considers legal rules as natural when the actors in a given society at a given point in time are brought together by a relative homogeneity of interests, uses and customs. Accordingly, all members of that society would naturally feel bound to follow those uses and customs regardless of their separate consent to them. In a divided society, on the contrary, or in areas where the society is divided, a positive voluntarist approach is naturally followed, whereby the process of formation or consolidation of custom international law becomes a sort of negotiated lawmaking process. Any axiomatic a priori choice on which is the better approach should give way to a pragmatic adjustment of the forms of codification to the historical political context characterizing the international society at any given point in history and to the attitude of states towards the international regulation of a specific subject matter. The swing in the codification trends of the work of the Commission confirms the inherent relativity of the choice of the most appropriate format, whether conventional or soft, 
Thus, from the 1950s to the 1970s, the most employed form of codification was that of draft articles aiming at a codification convention. Among the first example, one may recall the draft convention on the elimination of future statelessness, the draft articles on the law of the sea, on diplomatic intercourse and immunities, on the law of treaties, which ended up with the mother of all codification conventions. All these ILC drafting exercises eventually served as the bedrock for the drafting of a number of conventions that have remained as the pillars of contemporary customer international law. In the following decades, while continuing to mainly resort to draft articles, the Commission, often upon impulsion by the General Assembly, has started combining codification as evidentiary of existing law with increasingly progressive development of customer international law especially around the end of the Cold War and in the 1990s. Examples from that period include the draft articles on the law of treaties between states and international organizations or between international organizations, on the law of the non-navigational uses of international water courses, on state responsibility, on prevention of transboundary harm from hazardous activities. Today, in a complex multipolar world, it seems that the choice between binding and non-binding instruments has been stripped of any ideological political connotation in favor of functional needs, which as already alluded, pertain to the political circumstances existing at the time, and to the subject matter of the ILC, which the ILC is dealing with. In the present context, say over the last two decades, the diminished resort to the conventional format, rather than revealing a period of shared values in the international society, flags an alarming low rate of willingness among the international actors to assume fresh obligations. Consequently, since the beginning of this century, the ILC has more openly embraced its role as an informal progressive developer of customer international law. This may be found refer to be reflected in two empirical factors. The first one is that even when using the draft articles model, the Commission has sometimes explicitly specified that the subject matter of codification did not necessarily correspond to already settled customary law. Examples include draft articles on the responsibility of international organizations in the year 2000, ended in the year 2011, and those on the protection of persons in the event of disaster completed in 2016. In the commentary to the draft articles on the expulsion of aliens, completed in 2014, the Commission even admitted that, and I quote, the entire subject area does not have a foundation in customer international law or in the provisions of conventions of universal value, end of quotation. One may question the convenience for the International Law Commission to push its own progressive development agenda and draw up provisions in the absence of a clear practice that expresses a widely shared opinion juris. At the same time, it must be borne in mind that the Commission does not operate in a vacuum, but through constant interaction with the General Assembly's Sixth Committee. This circumstance also explains why the work of the Commission cannot be regarded as mere subsidiary means for the determination of the rules of law as a scholarly forum under Article 38.1d, but it enjoys greater normative authority, and I will elaborate on this shortly. Nothing prevents the draft articles from having a significant impact on states' conduct in the future. The by setting in motion 
a customer international law generating process. The second element I'd like to emphasize is that this new phase in the ILC work has coincided with the devising of an array of new forms of codification. True, the ILC work had resulted in non-conventional and conventional end products well before the end of the Cold War, War, but this choice was mainly due to the fact that the subject matter did not suit a codification by articles. Example include the draft declaration on the rights and duties of states, the model rules on arbitral procedure. Over the last two decades of the country, the ILC started producing guiding principles, conclusions, guides to practice, guidelines, issues paper. I may recall when it comes to guiding principles, um, the famous ILC product on unilateral declarations of states capable of creating legal obligations under the leadership of Professor Alain Pellet. When it comes to conclusions, I may recall those on fragmentation of international law, also concluded in 2006 under the leadership of Professor Marty Koskaniemi. Um, let me uh, mention, still on conclusions, the work on identification of customary law ended in 2016 under the leadership of Sir Michael Wood. The declining of the draft articles formula cannot be explained only by considering that some of the topics covered do not technically suit a conventional approach to codification. The fact is that, as already alluded, states have lately shown little interest in concluding major codification agreements on the basis of the work of the ILC. Indeed, over the last three decades, only two codification conventions have resulted from the work of the Commission, namely United Nations uh, Water Courses Convention of 1997 um, and um, the United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of 2004. To some extent, one may add the Rome Statute of 1998. The decline of the draft articles format is no surprise. It's the logical consequence of widespread treaty fatigue, whereby states are much less inclined to conclude large codification agreements than in the past, if only for the fact that the key, uh, the core principles of international law have been codified already by um, the conventional instrument. Recourse to more flexible forms is functional, on the other hand, to the current international political scenery, largely characterized by states' inertia in the field of international lawmaking. In this context, it is interesting to observe how international scholarship is reinterpreting, requalifying in very imaginative ways the work and role of the International Law Commission emphasizing, sometimes even over-emphasizing, the Commission's importance. Traditionally, the work of the Commission has been compared to subsidiary means for the determination of the rules of law pursuant to Article 38.1d of the ICJ statute. The LC work has been equated to, when I quote, the teaching of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations. In the last edition of Brownlee's Principles of Public International Law, the late James Crawford wrote, and I quote, a source analogous to the writings of publicists, and at least as authoritative, is the work of the ILC including its articles and commentaries, reports, and secretariat memoranda, and quotation. 
This classic approach was adopted by Sir Michael Wood himself in drafting the conclusions on, on identification of customer international law. He noted that for the purpose of assessing the role of the Commission, it said, quote, among writings, special importance may be attached to collective works, in particular the texts and commentaries emerging from the work of the International Law Commission, end of quotation. This stance, however, was not uncontroversial within the very Commission. A number of members expressed a view that by qualifying the work of the ILC as a mere subsidiary means on a par with the doctrine, does not adequately reflect its actual impact on the international customary making process. And this group within the Commission seems to have gotten the upper hand. In the commentary to part five of the draft conclusions on, then draft conclusions on the identification of customer international law, the Commission stated, and I quote, the output of the International Law Commission merits special consideration. This flows from the Commission's unique mandate to promote the progressive development of international law and its codification, the thoroughness of its procedures, and its close relationship with the General Assembly and states. It may be worth recalling, though, that this statement was somewhat mitigated by the following statement in the same source. The weight to be given to the Commission's determinations depends on various factors, including the sources relied upon by the Commission, the stage reached in its work, and above all, upon states' reception of its output." End of quotation. Be that as it may, the work of the Commission unquestionably enjoys a privileged position amongst the authorities relied upon in the diplomatic practice and in international case law, and that is an undisputable Matter of fact, Professor Laurence Boisson de Chazon has recently observed that, and I quote, the International Law Commission enjoys an authority per se, and this is socially recognized as the leading body with expertise in international law. And she added that the final products of the Commission are often qualified as falling under Article 38, Paragraph 1D of the Statute of the ICJ. However, authority is dynamic in nature. It can be gained, it can be lost, it can increase, it can decrease over time. Nothing is set, is, nothing is set in stone. The Commission and states are the custodians of this authority in the short term, but also in the longer term, end of quotation. And it is a matter of course that certain products of the Commission bear more authority than others, depending on various factors that have already been mentioned, including especially the support received by states. Another scholar, Dane Azaria has elaborated a thought-provoking idea of a codification by interpretation paradigm. In that paradigm, she places the Commission in a special position. She finds that under its mandate, the Commission would be tasked to interpret international customer law where, and I quote, it cannot be presumed that interpretation is singularly an aspect of codification or exclusively one of progressive development. This supposedly new function, however, would not entail providing a binding or authentic interpretation, but rather making an interpretative offer primarily to states with a view to prompting their reaction within and outside the United Nations system. Another more radical view propounded by Yifeng Cheng goes so far as to qualify the Commission as an autonomous lawmaker. Uh, eh, it, it, it. The idea would be that the LC 
has increasingly resorted to progressive development of international law as a tactic to develop new law and to keep itself occupied and relevant and setting the role of states in international lawmaking aside. In the interest of time, I will limit my critical appraisal to two general remarks over this new daring postures. First, I agree that the work of the ILC is more authoritative than the teaching of the mostly highly qualified publicists. And this is due to the intrinsic authority of the ILC uh, when its work and the contents of this work is particularly persuasive. Fine, but also depending on the widespread or less widespread reference that other actors on the international stage, especially international courts and tribunals and states, make to its work. The LC does not act in a vacuum and its work is directed and shaped throughout the interaction with the General Assembly Six Committee. So the closer to the observations by states, the comments by states expressed in the Six Committee, a text, the more authoritative it is. Second remark, no theory on the normative value of the work of the LC can downplay the importance of the role of states concerning in codifying, developing or even interpreting international customary law. So much so that they leave it for themselves or to international adjudication based on consensual jurisdiction, the role of interpreting the law. So the custodians of the interpretation of international law are th the law own makers, the states directly or adjudicative bodies which received states mandates by their consent. And let me now turn to the role of the International Court of Justice as the principal United Nations judicial organ and actually one of the principal United Nations organs under Article 7 of the Charter. And I will also refer to other United Nations related international courts and tribunals. The role of the International Court of Justice in the identification, consolidation and development of international law is a standalone locus classicus of international scholarship and would deserve a full length discussion, I will confine myself to very few selective remarks. First of all, I would like to emphasize that the developmental value of IC judgment is usually to be found in the so-called obita dicta parts of a decision, that is statements or passages that do not directly affect the resolution of the dispute before it. I may recall the famous 1970 Barcelona traction dictum where the court took the opportunity to put its seal on the existence of erga omnis obligations as, and I quote, the obligations of a state towards the international community as a whole, end of quotation. In so doing, it, the court substantively complemented the over abstract language led down in Article 53 of the Vienna Convention, the law of treaties on new scogans. The court has also contributed to the development of customer international law and the exercise of its advisory function, I may recall, the Genocide Convention advisor opinion, which significantly elaborated on the criteria concerning the admissibility of reservations to treaties. But the contribution of United Nations international courts and tribunals goes beyond the role of the International Court of Justice. The ITLUS has contributed to the progressive development of the law of the sea and international environmental law in areas such as freedom of high seas or illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, environment, environmental impact assessment and sustainable development. As already alluded, international uh, tribunal for the crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia established by means of the Security Council Chapter 7 resolution has laid down the foundations of contemporary 
criminal international law. In this regard, let me mention the Tadic case, where Judge Cassese presiding the appeals chamber basically forged the customer rules of international humanitarian law governing internal armed conflict. Judicial activism raises legitimacy concerns since lacking the stare decisis principle in international law, international adjudicative bodies are not formally endowed with the power of developing the law. They are well aware of this. Thus, the International Court of Justice has repeatedly stated, and let me mm, quote from the Fisheries Jurisdiction uh, Judgment in 19, 74, the court as a court of law, I quote, the court as a court of law cannot render judgment sub specie lege ferenda, or anticipate the law before the legislator has laid it down, unquote. In the nuclear weapons advisory opinion, the court reiterated and elaborated on the point, and I quote, the court's task is to engage in its normal judicial function of ascertaining the existence or otherwise of legal principles and rules. It states the existing law and does not legislate, end of quotation. Leaving aside this problem, which is more pertaining to the law of international adjudication, it should not be forgotten that the codification and development uh, of United Nations uh, international courts and tribunals is always dependent on how states will react to the judgments. That is ultimately will depend on the manifestation of the state's will either express or, as it is often the case for the great majority of states, a tacit one. Thank God, allow me, and I thank you very much for bearing with my long remarks. So let me go to my concluding remarks. Thank you. For this time, I won't reiterate how and to what extent the General Assembly, either directly or indirectly to the International Law Commission, the ECOSOC, the Secretary General, the Security Council, the International Court of Justice and other UN-related courts contri have contributed and contribute to the development of international law and its consolidation. It is important to note that, as I see it, any achievement in this area is hardly ever the produce of the United Nations as an independent international actor, as much as the forum and the catalyst for the expression of the legally relevant attitude of member states in different combinations. I believe that reflecting over the international lawmaking process within the United Nations institutional framework may be relevant for the purpose of understanding the current state of health of the international society, society precisely in its deeper societal dimension. Cyclically, all legal systems, all societies experience periods of crisis. As mentioned, a shift from a more value homogeneous to a more ideologically divided international society impacts the choice of the kind of legal source for the development of, interna of the international legal process according to a more natural law or legal positivist attitude. Today's worldwide critical so social and political juncture appears to be at one at the same time produced and aggravated by the state's difficulty to find sufficiently widely shared societal values, both within and between themselves. The global problems are generally shared and feared, but not the ways and means for their solution. Unilateral proactive pursuit of perceived shortcuts or negligent inertia prevail. The situation is worrisome, especially in the light of the challenges that the international society is increasingly facing. I may confine myself to recall the ongoing pandemic, climate change in its uh, multifaceted detrimental effects, unbalanced demographic growth, the finite character of natural resources 
essential to an adequate standard of living for all. Against this background, the United Nations become the depository of the goodwill and normative aspirations of its often two-faced members, which are torn between nationalism and international cooperation. In such way, the United Nations organs, especially but not exclusively the International Commission, with its non-governmental composition, venture on difficult paths against the oscillating attitude of states towards the codification and development of international law. States increasing recalcitrance to assume new legal obligations which they fear to lack the capacity or willingness to live up to accounts for the need for the ILC work to take a different path from the conventional forms of codification. Other options for general studies, possibly combined with operative language in terms of principles or conclusions. Obviously, aside from the exception of Chapter 7 security resolutions, the United Nations organs, including the Commission, cannot and do not create international law, but participate in shaping the contents of an authoritative normative offer addressed to the United Nations member states. In so doing, the United Nations legal process places the burden on individual states to turn down or to take up the offer. Responsible, reasonable and equitable national civil societies may hold government accountable for their choices or lack of such choices. However, disoriented, fragmented civil societies lacking in civil and human values we live in an international society of states disoriented and fragmented. This provides sufficient reason for all of us to continue to engage in our work and never to give in to the lack of hope. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Attila. It's really a long and very comprehensive uh, cover of the role of the United Nations, its organs to the development of international law. And you, you are very correct to point out that we, we see a lot of achievements uh, based on that history of how the United Nations organs, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Office of the Secretary General, ECOSOC, the, all the principal organs have, uh, and primarily the International Law Commission as a, uh, unifier of all efforts to develop international law. Uh, it's very difficult to add anything after such a comprehensive overview. I, I was thinking to mention Tadic and ICTY, but you, you cover really everything here. And I would like to have some conversation with the students. Uh, ju just to let you know that uh, they study law and practice of the United Nations, and uh, they have covered in, in uh, very great detail, the General Assembly and the Security Council. So I hope they will probably ask questions around uh, the relationship between uh, the principal organs, the ICJ relationship with Security Council, very much tested back in Lockerbie case when uh, the Security Council adopted sanctions on Libya for the attempted terrorist attack. Oh, well, actually, not attempted. It was an actual explosion of, a, yeah. of an aircraft uh, in Lockerbie, Scotland. And following that, the Security Council adopted sanctions demanding the extradition of the suspects. But Libya approached the International Court of Justice mentioning the Montreal Convention on Civil Aviation and arguing that member states can prosecute or extradite and saying that we will not extradite, we will prosecute. And it's not the Security Council, which is not a legal organ to uh, make judgment about our right under the Montreal Convention to prosecute or to extradite. Again, at, at that moment, the ICJ was uh, 
unprecedentedly put into the decision whether to challenge or even invalidate a Security Council decision. And obviously at that time, the expectation was that the ICJ will probably align itself with the Security Council, which it did properly, and they they quoted Article 103 of the United Nations Charter that obligations under the Charter prevail over obligations under the Montreal Convention on Civil Aviation. Therefore, for Libya, the first and foremost, it is an obligation to uh, enforce the Charter rather than the, the Montreal Convention on Civil Aviation. But later, if we look, that that was 25 years ago. If we look today, we will see not only ICJ, but even domestic court. In, for example, uh, Kadi, uh, one of the listed by the Security Council terrorist suspects in the resolution 1373, the resolution which uh, suspend financing of terrorist organizations. And in the annex of the resolution, we have list uh, of uh, blacklist, let's call it, of organizations and people who apparently have connections with terrorism. And uh, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, listening to Kadi, one of those uh, individuals, find out that effectively the Security Council resolution uh, violated the rights of an individual under the European Convention of Human Rights. An interesting challenge of the validity of all Security Council resolutions. So, kind of 25, 30 years ago, we were thinking that judicial review of Security Council would, decisions will not be possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, accumulating practice of several tribunals, and you pointed Tadic as another challenge of the establishment of the tribunal, whether that is within the legality or whether it's ultra virus action by the Security Council has been also added into that list of uh, possible challenges. So in other words, at least what happened is that the Security Council has become more disciplined, let's put it this way, thinking what these decisions might uh, result in after the challenges from Lockerbie, from Tadic, from... Uh, there's a Bosnia case, also the ICJ ruling on Bosnia genocide case. And more recently with Kadi uh, in uh, European court. And, and obviously, domestic court can also uh, react if they see violations of individual rights resulting from action by the Security Council. So the Security Council is no longer above the law. Its decision can also be uh, litigated and uh, even challenged. So uh, it, it's a good it, thing. Can I give a Go ahead. Your, your time. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you very much for, for your comments, which are very stimulating, and perhaps give us the opportunity to see a little bit the change in in the widespread attitude towards the authority of the United Nations Security Council, perhaps even the International Court of Justice. If we compare uh, Cardi with, uh, as you are doing, with uh, with the Lockerbie case. I mean, in in those years, let me think that they were good old years. Uh, a principle of homogeneity, unity, um, consistency uh, gave prevalence to the rules on compatibility. Uh, rather than uh, incompatibility. So the court relied on Article 103, uh, which is uh, a provision of compatibility whereby and giving priority to United Nations uh, 
charter obligations, both direct obligations directly stemming from the charter or indirectly from uh, legally binding United Nations Security Council resolutions whereby the resolutions adopted by the Security Council under Chapter 7 were found by the court to prevail over uh, conflicting treaty uh, obligations in this case that was the Montreal Convention invoked by Libya. So in those days uh, the the judicial um, uh, effort was aiming at enhancing coherence and consistency giving full authority uh, to the United Nations organs. If we look then at CADI and other domestic courts, uh, and that is the trend nowadays, very much of a nationalist trend, whereby um, Supreme Courts or Constitutional Courts uh, remain, advocate the guardianship of the domestic values over whatever international authority. Uh, I wanted to react to, to, to that and I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, uh, it, it's, a, it's very much a matter of fact and for us lawyers to, to delve into uh, this issue provides a toolkit even for uh, uh, non-lawyers to realize uh, where we stand in terms of social and political dynamics at the international level. I, I, as I see it. Thank you. Uh, Attila, I just want to add one thing and I will let Anki to follow up because I have another engagement later. But uh, at the time back in uh, 1990s, some of my uh, reluctance to see challenges against the Security Council has been triggered by the fact that if we make too many legal challenges, the Security Council can in fact become less uh, operative, it yeah. may reduce even the activity it, it is supposed to have been doing at the time. So uh, because it's a political organ, primarily uh, dealing with issues of peace uh, rather than issues of law, if we go too much in legal challenges against the council, countries such as Russia and China may simply say we won't do anything because see the ICJ may uh, hijack or may jeopardize our federation and in a sense whether we want to see a security council more active or less active because of too many legal challenges was a question at the time but that was at the time. I'm talking about 1990s. Yeah, was today, legit. I think today I'm more willing to see uh, further action to make sure that the Security Council does follow the legal route and doesn't simply follow the political and peace and security route. Well, that, that since the Security Council started addressing individuals next to states. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Abby, you want to go ahead and take some more uh, comments, make some suggestions? Thank you, Professor Poposki. Uh, Professor Tanzi, my, my question or what I wish to ask from you is on the topic of progressive progress, uh, progress and codification of international law. So how do you see the post-colonial states like India and other states being involved in the UN mechanisms in the period of 50 to 60 years, last 50 to 60 years, apart from uh, not only security and peace, but also other political issues, as Professor Poposki pointed out? Hmm. Well, well, let me just, let, let me just add to that because I had a similar question. I'll give you a context. Let's use Shago's Archipelago as a context of self-determination. Uh, <clears throat> the, the UN General, General Assembly resolutions which enshrine this principle of self-determination of states, would that in this context not be a principle of international law or at least have some sort of normative value attached to it in that sense becoming a catalyst for, if not law per se, but at least having some sort of value? Well, 
you know, I, I, I'll try and link the two, two questions because they are linked. Um, there's a lot of uh, law making policy. There's a lot of policy behind these considerations, and and policy considerations change according to policy balance. Um, you know the the ideology behind uh, uh, one inspiring one state or a group of states uh, lawmaking policy depends on the circumstances of the historical period of the time, and it may remain a little bit longer than strictly useful. Um, I mean, take the decolonization process has developed over uh, the legal recognition of a higher value of the principle of self-determination. Uh, one which would go beyond the simple protection of national minorities, uh, but one involving the right to secession. Therefore, as a countervailing uh, factor with respect to national sovereignty, where national sovereignty was being used by former colonial countries and national liberation movements uh, were the propelling engine which created so many newly formed states out of decolonization, uh, inspired by this principle, which was a countervailing principle with respect to national sovereignty. But newly formed states entered the circle of uh, state subjects and they absolutely attached to the principle of, uh, of uh, na political independence and, and territorial integrity uh, just as much as every uh, state uh, which had been formed since 1960, uh, 1648. Now, um, it is interesting to see the battle fought within the uh, General Assembly uh, to change uh, the lack of reference to self-determination in the UN uh, uh, de declaration, human rights declaration, universal declaration, human rights 1948, and get it in both uh, covenants in 1966. But now, you see, there is now, uh, I mean, it, it may be a nostalgic uh, <laughs> attachment by developing former developing countries, countries that are still developing, but are emerging, um, big emerging economic actors. I mean, take India, not, not just because I am uh, connected with India. I mean, you have a, a changing identity issue there. Your identity is, is changing. You are becoming a big economic power. And there you may have a little bit of a schizophrenic problem looking backward at some of the old ideological uh, attachment to the concept of, of uh, principle of self-determination, unless you give it a radically uh, different interpretation. You don't want uh, to, I suppose, uh, uh, you want perhaps to enhance domestic policy for the protection of a national minority, but you would never want to go as far as to associate today to the principle of um, um, self-determination, the kind of interpretation which was being given during the decolonization uh, revolutionary process, which uh, attached to the principle of self-determination the right to secession. Uh, I think that uh, is clearly something which runs against uh, uh, the interest of many decolonized states. Yet, yet you have India's ambassador speak on Chagos on request from the world court yeah. on this matter so explain that then <laughs> i can explain to you i mean that that is you know that's a matter of uh, taste nostalgia uh, uh looking at at the past this is a backward looking attitude if you want to look at uh, uh the interest of of, of India, I think uh, you have more of an interest in safeguarding 
the principle of um, of territorial integrity uh, and national sovereignty, and you can well say that the Chagos issue is is a, is an exception to 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 that. I mean, that is an historical issue. I wouldn't base my forward-looking uh, policy towards the principle of self-determination uh, through the lens of the Chagos uh, uh, issue. It, it, Chagos. It, 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 is a legacy of the past, which should be probably settled. That I agree uh, with 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 the standards that inspired uh, uh, the decolonization policy. But uh, India is way ahead of uh, uh, beyond that decolonization process. You you are uh, projected into the future. You're not looking into the past uh, in, for your own national. Um, strategic interest uh, standpoint. Thank you. I, I, I believe that decolonization is very much of uh, uh, a cultural heritage of yours, which I think should remain embedded in your national identity, and that is fair enough. But uh, in terms of the utilitarian side of the lawmaking policy of each state, uh, if you were to keep inspiring your policy, including domestic policy, on the yardstick uh, of the decolonization process, you would not serve the um, interest of the buttressing um, uh, the, the unity and the territorial integrity of, of India, would you? Uh, this seems like a strong a critique of of twail as well because the razor the actor for twail is take suffering seriously <laughs> i'm being slightly provocative here but you've already given an answer to this and i and i agree with you i think even with scholarship like twail it seems rather critical it seems to 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 also be uh uh malevolent but but its root is critical, but it doesn't further further an ambition. I think it started with a very noble intention at Bandung Conference in the in the era of, of the non-aligned movement, but as time progressed, it's taken a turn which has made it into a, 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 a pernicious perspective. I'll I'll shift grounds slightly, but I'll request Whoever wants to share their questions, to please do so in the chat box, chat box or raise their hands. I'll shift grounds and I'll move to human rights and also link it to climate change and seek your perspective on how the United Nations, more specifically the ILC, can be useful. Articles 2.1 and 4.3 of the Paris Agreement together are being used to determine and substance of human rights obligations with respect to climate change rights for the Palestine of, of, of NYU. It says that in a recent communication to the UN Committee on the Rights of Child, the petitioners who were 16 children and youths claimed that international humanitarian rights obligations are informed by the rules of international environmental law that the Convention on the Rights of Child must be interpreted, taking into account the respondents' obligations under these, under these uh, international principles. Reducing emissions at the highest possible ambition, they claim, implies inter alia using maximum available resources and a responsibility of due diligence. COP26 is going to happen. Is why is ILC not taking the forefront in creating legal mechanisms, legal uh, persecutions of, of those who are responsible for crimes against the environment? Why is Ecocide not, why did Ecocide come now and not 20 years ago? And why is an independent committee doing this? Are we, are we, I'll just add another letter to this, then you can take it. Why are we lacking statesmen? Are we lacking statesmen like Sir Winston Churchill, who created the
the European Charter for Human Rights and, and imagine the United States of Europe. Of course, Muslim, you also believed in it. And you yeah. can add to that as well as, as of course, <laughs> that would be very interesting. But what I'm trying to hint towards is what, what Churchill said as sinews of peace. He imagined it and therefore it became reality. Why is this not being done with climate change? To my mind, COP26 will not do much. And we're all frustrated like like the queen who, who's visibly irritated now and, and has been caught on camera saying it. So those are my thoughts, more of frustrations. Yeah, well, I thank you very much for your question, which uh, I, 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 I find uh, close to my my heart, but also to my uh, my purely legal background. Uh, and I may add a, a, a scholarly frustration when answering to your question. When I, I have uh, studied from very from a very close position, um, the path of the law, the ILC work on the law of state responsibility. And under the uh, special rapporteurship of uh, late Judge Agha, well, prior to, to become uh, judge, he drafted uh, and uh, with great success at the time, draft article 19 then draft article 19 on international crimes of states. You mentioned ecocide. Uh, and, um, and, and he made a, a distinction which was met with some hesitation, but not with outright uh, a dismissal by states in the Sixth Committee. The distinction between, uh, say, internationally, ordinary internationally wrongful acts and international crimes of states, one of them being aggression and one being uh, massive uh, breaches of international environmental obligation. So the idea was already there and we were in the mid 1970s, Ankit, can you imagine? So the, it is not the ILC, I mean, the ILC is an institution, is a subsidiary organ of the General Assembly of the United Nations, and at the end of the day, it does what the states ask her to, to do. They choose the agenda in the end, and, and, and the agenda can go forward and make progressive states support that agenda. So let's go back on states. Forget about, I know what you mean by saying the, 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 the International Commission, because you see there the need for some technical, legal uh, mechanisms for, for, uh, for uh, uh, giving effect to international generally agreeable basic substantive obligations. There you say we need a system, a mechanism. Well, in fact, the reason why I am in, uh, in, in Oslo and the reason why I, I should be leaving you in, in a while is that we are discussing a compliance review or uh, uh, implementation and compliance review committees which are being produced by international environmental, uh, um, multilateral environmental agreements, you see. And, uh, a, a, and that is a way to try and go about um, the recalcitrance of states to go before international adjudication for environmental um, disputes uh, generally. I mean, it, it happens. We have had quite a number of cases before the ICJ, but you cannot imagine to prove that uh, any multilateral environmental agreement on 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 pollution or gas emissions and uh, uh, would be any successful uh, to have a jurisdictional clause there and who besides would uh, trigger uh, a dispute litigation about massive uh, uh, pollution of the atmosphere no one no state would do against another state knowing that uh, the potential claimant itself could be one day sued before uh, for lack of capacity, if only, or willingness to comply with international standards. So I think that we very much have to rely on two possible uh, courses of action. As far as adjudication is concerned, we may find 
formulas adjudicatively vindicating uh, environmental uh, rules insofar as they link up and now this is done uh, international environmental state obligations translate into human rights and they may be vindicated before domestic courts and supranational courts where available you see so that is one way and the other way is a quasi jurisdictional um, a means of mechanisms where you have non-confrontational, non-judicial means of uh, um, compliance monitoring, uh, which may even include uh, facilitation and assistance for states to comply with international standards. Because you can have a state, we were just talking about developing states, it may well be that certain international standards are uh, not abided by a state for lack of capacity, which may be financial, but also technological, maybe legal and administrative. You have to uh, boost the administrative system whereby you have major administrative and scientific experts in the capital, but 4,000 kilometers away from the capital where you have uh, problems of uh, activities which are being carried out that may substantively impact on the environment and the local authorities have no clue on how to handle the situation. So you need to provide international cooperative facilitating assisting systems that may enhance capacity so state responsibility may help but may help to some extent and at the end of the day we are confronted with the lack of willingness by states to accept to give their consent to stringent systems uh, assessing their responsibility in this field but i think the 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 path uh, ahead uh, will be probably significantly marked by uh, domestic and supranational case law. And we wait and see what happens in the next uh, couple of years, Ankit. I suspect I have to leave. Um, and you, Apollo, uh, forgive me for that. Uh, okay, Samad, please proceed. I request you to just be brief. So if, if that is OK, it is okay. one short it's, question. Yes, it is OK. So Good Mark. evening, Professor Massimiliano, and thank you for the lecture. So I had a very short question for a red, a very hot topic right now in India because Diwali is almost around the corner. And as Ankit said that UN also takes part in a lot of climate change activities as well. So the, uh, the debate is about the use of firecrackers in festivals. And being a Hindu and a very devoted, you know, uh, worshipper of Lord Ram, and I know the historical value of the festival, but I'm also aware of the climate change and how it needs our imminent attention. So I just wanted to know what is the United Nations stand and what are your opinions about the use of firecrackers for celebrations, not only for festivals, but also for occasions like football matches, cricket matches, New Year's and all of these where we use firecrackers to display our um, enthusiasm and affection to the occasion. So what is the United Nations uh, thinking about this issue? Because uh, uh, firecracker companies are also very um, uh, heavy contributors to the economy and it is a very big industry in the world as well. So if we ban the these industries, it will take a toll on the global economy as well. So I just wanted a very brief uh, opinion of yours and the United Nations stand on this issue uh, of firecrackers. Thank you. So well, religion and state. Uh, firecrackers. <laughs> are, are, uh, are part of the problem, uh, but interestingly, uh, they suggest a twofold problem. On the one hand, uh, from taking it from the last part of your question, uh, needs of conciliation of uh, the enhancement of environmental sa standards on the one hand, and, uh, and uh, without curbing um, economic development concerns, and that lies with the uh, famous sustainable development principle. You have to try and balance. Uh, and, and that is the economic versus the legal uh, side uh, forward. 
the other, and, and there you have a process of uh, law refinement uh, in finding a balance between economic and environmental interests within the uh, very general uh, sustainable development concept through ad hoc, uh, one by one, um, international conventions uh, or multilateral environmental agreements, except that states nowadays are not very keen on entering into new uh, international obligations. So the sustainable development principle is, has been largely developed uh, through international multilateral conventions, but is not looking like this going to be further developed in the near future. Um, uh, and that is one. Uh, the other leg of the, the issue, when you attach certain customs or uses to traditions, religious tradition, you have two different uh, values which uh, and concerns which are under international legal protection. You have environmental concerns which are under uh, international legal protection, and but you also have traditional heritage values, religious values, traditions that are also under under protection. Um, at the level of the United Nations, I mean, you you have to think of what is the common policy, lawmaking policy denominator. And I would not see for the near future the possibility that certain issues of the kind will have will be directly expressly regulated. There will be problems arising also in terms of disputes, uh, including litigation, and there there will be a, 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 a matter for balancing. Um, protection under UNESCO conventions, under basic human rights uh, uh, protection to um, of religious values, um, cultural heritage on the one hand, and environmental uh, values. I mean, um, there are uh, agricultural uses that have been carried out for centuries that may at some point become um, prohibited under new environmental regulation. So it will be then a matter for uh, giving priority to needs rather than abstract values. And I suspect that in the long run, I, I speak for myself, unfortunately, uh, many beautiful things that we are used to uh, of, ma of many right uses uh, that we are attached to, including sports, for example, perhaps, uh, um, will have to succumb uh, against uh, the increasing uh, uh, new regulatory background uh, uh, protecting uh, environmental values. I'm, I'm thinking even of golf courts in, in the medium long term. Uh, I don't know whether that we will be able to, to use that amount of water uh, for irrigation of golf courts around the world if the right of access to water uh, is, is, is seriously compromised by climate change, you see. And I'm sure that the International Association of, of Golf Players will not be very happy with it, but when it comes to to drinking and, and and they will have to give up golf and take up something else. Sorry for for making it a little bit banal, but I started taking it very seriously, and I think that it is a problem of convergence and fragmentation. You have the body of international environmental law which is developing. It is converging and cross fertilizing with the body of human rights law, and within the body of human rights law, you have uh, protection of religious values as, as, as human rights, but within the human rights body of international law, you also have the green environmental rights of individuals, um, which include also uh, corresponding obligations on the part of individuals. Uh, so, 
Um, I am, and this will depend on 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 uh, on the objective uh, and, and developments concerning climate change. But uh, I'm not optimistic. If I have to listen to what is being said these days about around the COP, uh, whatever the the Queen believes, uh, I am not particularly optimistic. I get. So thank you for all these questions. Thank you for all hospitality. And I take it that I am booked in for an in-person uh, visit to India before too late, Ankit. Surely, surely. The, the honor to host you will be ours and to 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 spar with the, the, the Chancellor will also will also be ours. And I on behalf of Professor Poboski, thank you. And I also thank uh, the students who've joined us and also your students who've joined us. It's indeed excellent to have a, a global discussion in a global university or a global classroom. We are thankful and grateful to everyone for their time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye.